Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shelley Ware, and welcome to the final Life and Health Reimagined online event. Where do we go next with prevention? I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet today and pay my respects to all elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to also acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are watching us here all around Australia. So thank you very much. Well, Victoria finds itself in stage three lockdown. So here we are all at home today, hoping that our dogs don't bark and our children don't yell out. Um, and I imagine that we all know how that feels. But I'd like to introduce Dr. Sandro DeMeo, who is the CEO of Big Health, to say a few words about today's event and he will give us his thoughts on the future of prevention. Thanks very much, Shelley. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, which I'm uh, live casting in from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. And well, welcome to the final, the fifth uh, webinar and uh, week of Health Reimagined, Life and Health Reimagined from uh, Big Health uh, and our many, many partners uh, the last five weeks have flashed by and when we started this journey we thought uh, we would continue to be coming out of restrictions and looking at life beyond coronavirus uh, as of course Victoria has endured the last few weeks of uh, reinstating lockdowns. I think the importance of convening, of reflecting, of uniting as a community, a public health community but as a wider community through these events has in fact become even more important um, these, these series of events uh, really will help not only Vic Health, but I think uh, all of our partners, and we hope you as well, to shape your ideas and your thinking about life and health and prevention beyond uh, coronavirus and um, the many challenges that it's thrown up to us as a society and as a community. Uh, in uncertainty, community is indeed more important than ever, and the challenges we face uh, leading in, in many ways to new forms of innovation, including in the prevention space. And with this comes incredible opportunity, as we saw uh, so clearly in the paper by Lisa Gibbs and Professor, Professor Lisa Gibbs and Anna Peters this week. As we look to recovery, when that does come and it will come, uh, we also need to make sure that we are indeed building back better, that we're thinking about a world post-coronavirus that is more equitable, more sustainable, uh, and more healthy than the one we had uh, just a few months ago. That this, in, this huge challenge that we've gone through as a community, as a global community, that we use it uh, a once in a century and a once in a generation opportunity to rethink some of the ways we work together, uh, the very societies and, and, um, and political, social, cultural, and all other dimensions of life that shape health uh, and shape, shape the achievement of health and, and with it well-being. Finally, I'd just like to thank um, everyone who's made the last five weeks possible. It's been a, an all-star and all-team and a global effort for those who have called in uh, at five o'clock in the morning, including Guy on mm -hmm. our panel today, uh, for the many panellists who gave up their time to Virginia and Shelley, who so wonderfully uh, directed and curated uh, the panels each week to the huge team of journalists and support and partners who allowed us to have those really uh, rich conversations on social media and in various written formats uh, across each week and of course to all of you watching around Victoria, around Australia and around the world, um, you know, a big thank you from the Vic Health team and on behalf of the CEO I'd also like to just acknowledge my own team here at Vic Health who have um, worked really so hard through some difficult uh, and challenging um, bumps, shall we say, uh, to indeed take today completely online as we all return home to uh, lockdowns once again. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you. I look forward to the discussion today and just a very big thank you uh, once again from the Big Health team and thank you, Shelley. Well, thank you, Sandra. There's so many people to thank because it's been um, a huge success and I couldn't agree with you more that community is certainly so important through this time. So let's do some housekeeping before we get into our panel. Um, 
please post all of your questions or vote for your favourites in Slido and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. You can also post your technical issues and we may have them on Slido as well and the team will certainly try to get to them to help you. I'd like to welcome back the fabulous Jesmy from Pick in Colour who will be capturing today's discussion in live illustration which will be available after the event. And the recordings of today's event will also be made available on the Life and Health Reimagined webpage. And finally, if you would like to multitask, you can join the conversation on social media using the hashtag Health Reimagined. And now before I introduce our panel today, let's play a short presentation by Professor Lisa Gibbs, who is the Director of the Child and Community Wellbeing Program in the Centre of Health Equity at the University of Melbourne. Hello, my name's Lisa Gibbs and I'm from the University of Melbourne and I co-authored an article with Professor Anna Peters from Deakin University about what next for prevention. And when I was asked to co-author this article, it really seemed important to me to bring in our evidence on disaster resilience. Because even though this is a, a really massive event that we've never experienced before, there is a lot we can learn from previous major disasters because even if they're rapid onset like bushfires or slow onset like droughts and pandemics, uh, the human impacts are remarkably similar and we can look at evidence from those previous events on how things play out over time. And certainly what we know is that most people are remarkably resilient and able to adapt to change and disruption. Uh, but it does increase risk of, of physical and mental health issues. There's no question of that. And that is particularly the case if people are having to deal with the other things that happen alongside these events and in the months and years afterwards. Things like loss of income, change of accommodation, strain on relationships, disruption to social networks, all of these things add extra stress and undermine our capacity to cope. And so it's important at this time to recognise that this is something that is affecting us all and it's quite normal in dealing with these disruptions to feel different, to not cope as well as you might normally. Uh, and it's also quite normal to feel like you're waiting till your everyday life comes back. And certainly I've been doing that. Um, when in fact, it's probably more helpful for health and wellbeing to say, well, this disruption is going to go on for some time. So I need to think about how I manage in this context. How do I maintain health and wellbeing at this time? And it was great to see from the Big Health Survey that, that there are many people who have managed to increase their exercise and improve their, their eating habits while this is all going on. And obviously, you know, we are all living in different circumstances and some people are, are dealing with more stresses than others. But it's helpful to be reminded that while there are clear challenges during this period, there are also opportunities and we can change things to deal with what's going on now and we can also think about well how are we going to do things going forward into the future and this is referred to as a transilient approach it's the shaping of the future leaping forward to a new way of doing things where we we recognize strategies, practices that we can carry forward. We claim some of these new ways of doing things and say, well, this is serving us well and we will keep doing these as, as we proceed. And also thinking about, do we need to reshape what we're doing to manage with a changed future? And certainly one of the things that we've seen really clearly is that we have the capacity to make dramatic changes not just at an individual level, but at a systemic level, to keep people safe. And as inequities become really apparent in these times, 
not that they haven't been there previously, but they become more evident at this time. It's an incredible opportunity to say, well, can, can we be doing things in a better way? Can we be changing our personal and collective practices to promote health equity for all? And certainly from our disaster resilience research, it's quite clear that in communities and societies where we see a mobilisation of collective efforts, a social solidarity in response to these major events, we see better outcomes for everybody. Whereas in places where there's a tendency to focus on individual survival and you see a social deterioration as a result, the outcomes are not great. So I would recommend, and certainly what Anna and I were proposing in our paper, is that we take the time to think about what's, what's happening, what's changing and how we're responding and take a transilient approach as we go forward to promote best outcomes in terms of health and wellbeing for everybody. Thank you and enjoy your panel discussion. Thank you, Professor Lisa Gibbs, for sharing. And I couldn't agree more. I really liked it when you said reshape what we are doing for a changed future. And that is certainly where we're at right now, a time of reflection um, on what is happening in the world. So let's introduce our panel members today. And let's start with Topi Adekoibi. Um, Topi Adekoibi is head of the Health Places Achievement Program at Cancer Council Victoria. Topi is also an honorary associate at the Burnett Institute and has worked in both communicable and non-communicable diseases programs in numerous countries, including Papua New Guinea, India, Ethiopia, Tanzania, South Africa, and Jamaica. So welcome, Topi. Thank you, Hi. <laughs> it's great to have you with us. And I'd now like to introduce Guy, Dr. Guy Phones. Guy is the advisor to the Secretariat of the Global Coordinate Mechanism of the Non-Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization. Guy is a medical doctor from Chile with 25 years experience in the public, private and global health sectors. So welcome Guy to today's panel. Welcome, a pleasure to be here. And thank you for waking up so early too from Geneva. So Dr. Selena Lowe, Selena is a Senior Research Fellow at the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Selena is also a Consulting Editor to The Lancet and holds honorary aff affiliations to the University at Melbourne School of Population and Global Health and the United Nations University Institute of Global Health in Malaysia. So welcome, Selena. Thanks for having me, Shelley. Oh, our pleasure. The Professor Anne Peters. Anne is a Professor of Epidemiology and Equity in Public Health and Director of the Institute for Health Transformation at Deakin University. Anna is particularly interested in the provision of information to facilitate objective and equitable changes in public health and health policy by policymakers, practitioners and the public. Anna is also a member of the Vic Health Board. So welcome, Anna. Thanks very much, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you. The Honourable Nicola Roxon was a member of the Australian Parliament for 15 years representing Labor in the Western suburbs, Melbourne's seat of Jellybrand. During this time, Nicola was served as the Health Minister, Attorney General and Minister for Emergency Management. She is currently the Chair at HESTA and holds a number of non-executive director roles at organisations in Australia. So welcome, Nicola. Hello, nice to see you. Thanks for having Hello. me. Great to have you all here on the panel with us today. So many wonderful humans. So let's start with you, Anna. The term transilient is used a lot in the paper that you and Lisa wrote for this week. Now, Lisa touched on this in her overview, but can you talk some more about what this term looks like in real life and how we can incorporate it into our work? Yeah, of course. Look, thanks again. Um, I just want to start by saying that I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. I think if we can take forward some of the lessons that we've learnt post-COVID, um, that'll be a really nice way to try and create some good out of quite a lot of tragedy at the moment. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed putting the paper together with Lisa and learnt a lot about disaster research. And I think the term transilience is a really useful one 
both for us right now in terms of dealing with a pandemic, but also really then in terms of thinking about how we might tackle some of the really complex issues we have in society in a more general sense going forward. So I guess um, we're pretty used to the term resilient and I think in some ways transilience is really um, allows us to evolve on that. So we often think about having to be strong amidst change, being able to bounce back. But I guess in, in my head that's kind of like a big strong tree that kind of stands there. And actually what we've realised with COVID is, is we need to be more of a bendy flexible tree that can kind of move um, according to the conditions and, and really seek out its nutrients in, in the way that it might need to with flexibility and agility. And, and so I think Lisa gave a really good kind of technical definition of, of transilience and I guess that's kind of how I, I see it in my mind. And I think a really practical example is how people are thinking about adaptations to working from home at the moment. Everybody's really, you know, completely across the country had to change how they work. And I think as individuals, as families, as communities and organisations, we're all asking ourselves, how can we take forward post COVID elements that we've, um, you know, adapted to work from home that are actually working better for us? So a lot of people are talking about better flexibility, lack of commuting, that's good for families, it's good for exercise, it's good for the environment, but then actually leave behind what we are seeing as the negative elements. So the social isolation, the, the lack of connectivity. So I think that that's a really practical, tangible example of, of how we might think about transilience going forward. And in terms of incorporating it into um, how we work, I think we'll probably talk about this a bit more later, and I guess what I would like from all of us is to start to really reflect on what are the processes that we're seeing in action at the moment that we think are enabling us to take forward the good things and leave behind the bad things. And then I think we'll be able to apply them more generally um, to other conditions, even post COVID. Thanks. Brilliant. There's a lot to um, take from that. But Toby, following on from this, in this approach, something you've seen in organisations you work in with the Achievement Program, are there other approaches you've seen from organisations working directly with local communities that point to a new way of working? Thanks so much, Shelley. And like Anna, I really do appreciate um, the opportunity to talk about these issues. And for me as well, shine a bit of a spotlight on the great things that um, the Healthy Workplaces and Healthy Schools and Healthy Early Childhood Services Achievement Program members have been doing. And the concept of transilience is certainly something that resonates um, regarding what we've seen. So, you know, part of transilience that talks about letting go of practices that don't support physical and mental health, as Anna, as Anna mentioned, inflexible working arrangements is really a big one um, that we've seen that sort of very rapidly workplaces have had to let go of that. and look at new ways of working, you know, how, how does it look when you don't go nine to five with a long commute? And what are the impacts on health and wellbeing um, when you move to new modes? Uh, virtual environments. So for the first time, many workplaces have had a huge focus on promoting health and wellbeing, but they're not doing that in the four walls of the office. They're actually in a position where they're trying to do that through a screen and in a virtual environment. Um, so great initiatives from our members, virtual cooking clubs, focusing on healthy recipes, you know, actively trying to involve people at risk of isolation through engaging them with that. Online exercise, meditation, Tai Chi, those are all things that um, really promote accessibility for people of all abilities to be able to participate in physical activity, you know, creativity, taking virtual mini holiday breaks by changing your screen backdrop was one I really liked from our members. You know, pets as therapy, we've seen that all over the world, haven't we? Another one I liked is here in Victoria, obviously football mad, so virtual footy training, using pets as teammates to practice drills. Um, working with communities, so a community health organisation that we work with teamed up with their local ABC radio station to broadcast daily pre-recorded physical activity sessions. You know, not everyone is in the workplace, um, is at home working, you know. So, so that was another really nice one. So we've seen these new partnerships forming and new modes of health promotion delivery um, that haven't been utilised before and there's a real creativity. And so perhaps without fully realising it, our members have in fact been taking a transilient approach and um, we hope that that continues and uh, we, as Anna said, take forward 
that which has been working and uh, accelerate and, and retain these practices. Brilliant. I think there's a few things I can take from that myself in there. I liked that. Now, Guy, you've seen some examples of transilient approach on a global or national scale in your work with the World Health Organization. And what can Australia learn from these? Thank you again, and, and again, a pleasure to, 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 to be part of this panel. Um, this is, uh, it was very exciting to see the, 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 the paper where, that we were shared before this, uh, the, the panel discussion. Uh, and, and it really, really it gave a lot of, lot of food for thought in, in what transilience really means and how we've been using it, as your question points to, how we've been using it in, in global and, and sort of uh, international platforms. And it really brought to attention one huge, huge step in, in, in a transilient global community, which was navigating from the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, to the SDGs. It's a huge example of the global community really trying to understand exactly how to bring forth those. Unfortunately, we've lost you a bit, Guy. There must be a break in some technical difficulties there. So hopefully we get him back. And while we're waiting for Guy, we'll um, go to you, Selena. Um, what about you? So we've tucked you in now. So <laughs> while we're waiting for Guy, how do you see public health changing or adapting to coronavirus? Or are there things you think we need to do differently? Thanks very much, Shelley. Um, and um, also to uh, Anna for um, presenting um, the really interesting um, paper and mm. concept of resilience, which um, uh, really um, resonated actually in terms of um, thinking of um, the future of prevention. So, I mean, we've in Australia had um, a pretty traumatic 2020 in terms of the beginning with the bushfires and then looking into this pandemic and then even afterwards all of our, all of our uncertainty and the things that we haven't measured really um, in the health response, including mental health burden. But um, by and large, I think, you know, we've done quite well and um, looking to come out of it. There might be, um, you know, two areas, one more acute and one more um, working long term that, that I think uh, we could look at better, both for um, pre pre preparing for other, hopefully not many future pandemics, but also um, how we um, um, look at our legacy of our generation. And the first one is, uh, a very practical one, that of, um, you know, protection of our um, healthcare workers. And you might ask, how is that prevention? Well, it's prevention in the first instance of disease um, and infection. And globally, we've really had both shortages and troubles in access, um, which um, uh, really shouldn't be the case in certain countries that had time to prepare for this. Uh, earlier this week at a um, Lancet UCL lecture, the director of the World Bank, Mahabha Pate, said that um, countries should be looking at preparing strategic national stockpiles each, um, you know, going forwards and treating um, both um, protective personal equipment, such as masks and gowns, also um, uh, new vaccines and technologies as um, global goods for health. And I think... Um, uh, even though they are um, um, somewhat seen as these, you know, typical biomedical approaches, I think in terms of the approach and our attitude towards how we access them, um, we have to have a different kind of attitude towards that. And I, I do wonder whether this notion of transilience, you know, looking beyond our, you know, current um, obstructions and barriers could leapfrog that in this instance, and that's one opportunity. And then obviously the second one um, for us to consider is um, um, our own responses to climate change and our um, ecological um, situations. Uh, I would say that COVID and climate change have got a lot in common, in fact. the are three things, complex science to be communicated. They both require global international cooperation and indeed the most vulnerable are the most affected. But where they've been different is, is really in the response. So, um, if we can, you know, use these um, um, this uh, motivation and um, discovery that um, we see the links um, between the pandemic and our natural world, um, uh, both in terms of the uh, relationship, you know, animal to human, 
but also in terms of the habitat destruction that we've done, uh, that would be um, a really fantastic opportunity to take, um, take heed of. Beautiful. Thank you, Selena. I think we have Guy back. If you could unmute yourself, Guy, and hopefully we can get a second go at your answer. Let's let's try this again. I'll be quick, <laughs> um, Shelley. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yes. I was just, you know, you, we were landing on some sort of examples and uh, or processes that, were, that showcase the resilience of the global community. And I was really touching on our, our our global shift from the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, to the Sustainable Development Goals. That was an extremely interesting exercise where we did exactly what the transilient definition sort of points to. And I think it also provides some really in-depth insights into what we should be thinking on to the COVID, uh, COVID response to build back better approaches. <clears throat> in particular, sort of the, the SDGs, what, what actually it, 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 it accomplished is really placing health in the midst of the development uh, agenda. It really, it really showcased the interlinkages with, with, the, with the huge and comprehensive, integrated, indivisible, an inclusive development agenda. And, and it's, sh it's showing us slowly, we're not there yet, I think, it's showing us the, 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 the connections that health um, and the interdependent, interdependence that health has with other agendas in the development area, in particular security, in particular uh, health and well-being, um, health and well-being as the SDG three. Um, the connections are are throughout the all of the 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 the, 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 the social, economic, environmental determinants of health. That is really showcasing us what we should have been building a bit more stronger in the past years to really prepare us for for a for a for a people centered approach, which we now are looking into. Um, how can we transform health development and health security and, and respond to people's needs at the same time while responding to global, global intersections on the economic, financial and development agenda? Um, the inclusive leave no one behind philosophy of the SDGs is critical to really understand what that means, who is being left, who is being left behind, and, and how do we uh, approach those who are being left behind. That will be essential for the COVID to build back better response. And I think there's much, there's much to learn there. The, the, the non-communicable disease agenda, also for the first time uh, making its way to a, a global political uh, development agenda was extremely important, really unpackaging also the, the intersections of health, well-being, and social determinants of health. And I think we've got much to learn there. And I think as we move forward, we will have to integrate some of these principles and, and, and criteria used in the SDG development for the COVID Build Back Better. I'll stop there, but I think we may have more time later for, for yes. to get a little deeper on some of these. Yeah. We will get, we'll certainly get back to you. And it's, I'm glad that we got you back here at the moment. Yeah. So Nicola, governments around the world are facing unprecedented, unprecedented dyslexia kicks in every now and then on a couple of words, <laughs> challenges right now. In terms of public health and prevention, what do you think are some of the key things people working with governments at various levels should keep in mind as we look to see some of the opportunities and silver linings as we learn from coronavirus? Thanks very much. Look, it's a, a really difficult time and I think so many of the other panellists are working in areas where we know that um, the urgent really does often push out the important. And so I think a discussion like this allows us to think about the things we can take from this and, and sort of step back occasionally from the most urgent issues that are confronting everyone at the moment. So I think a real challenge for governments to keep in mind, and it's just such a hard thing to do, is we really need to build systems that are versatile. That's why I really like this transilient approach. But actually, mostly, um, government programs are in silos, they're for episodic care, they're very medicalised. It really needs a quite significant rethink if we want to value the ability to move quickly to cope with the health consequences of bushfire or quickly to cope with a pandemic or, or whatever we know will be more challenges that come in the future. So I think we need to really um, ask what is it that would make our system more versatile and I personally think that this is the moment for primary care at last to assert its ascendancy, if you like, in the health system. Um, that's not to take away from the fantastic work that doctors do and that we need done in ICUs, and, but actually we see through this that it's the nurses, it's the allied health professionals, it's those that um, communicate effectively uh, in local communities that are the ones that can really help us cope quickly with a changing situation that we're facing at the moment. Um, 
So I think we need, if, if that moment is to be maximised, uh, we need to think about how we can better coordinate primary care. Um, you know, it can't be a cottage industry. It need, we need to think about how we will have all those networks. And I mean, Big Health already does fantastic work in this area, but I think how do we scale that up even more significantly? Um, the opportunity that we get to seize is that for an unusual point in time, people understand the urgency of the building blocks that at other times people see as a kind of nice to have add on, you know, that prevention can get put in the box that we'll deal with it when we've got our ICUs working properly and we'll deal with it later. We need to flip that around so you, and use this sense of um, urgency right now. Um, and the language I think of comparing it to bushfire is very good. People get why you have to act quickly, why you have to be prepared, what's needed in communities. And I think the core two things that I think um, it'd be great for, for governments to think more about is for all of this to work effectively, we need good health literacy. Um, and that requires investing in our populations um, understanding, awareness uh, and knowledge, but it also, the flip, the flip side of that or what might come from that is we actually really need trust in government. We need trust in experts. We need to think about the channels for how we communicate that. And I think sometimes those things are seen by governments, again, as a nice thing to have and, of course, something to strive for, but not really always something to invest in. This pandemic um, really shows us that if you don't invest in those things, you actually make your response much more challenging. And to be truly transilient, I think we need those things. And um, it's quite a big wish list, but I think there are four or five things that if we could think differently about that, um, it's a great opportunity for government. And they'll have uh, governments will have around the world huge support for doing some of these things that maybe have perceived in the past as a bit of a icing on the cake rather than the foundation for building a really resilient um, you know, health system into the future, or transilient, I should say, um, system into the future. I think we've certainly learned what our foundations are during this time, that's for sure. But this week's paper also calls out how coronavirus has highlighted the interconnectedness of social, financial, political, built, natural, human and cultural influences on our health and wellbeing. I'm interested in the panel's thoughts on how this can impact health promotion as we move forward and indeed how this differs from our business as usual in health and wellbeing. And Selena, what are your thoughts? Thanks again, Shelley. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate the last comments um, on um, the um, importance of um, uh, investing in primary care as a building block, but also of investing in systems. And um, I mean, there are several opportunities now um, in terms of looking at the transition to more sustainable systems. Um, and in particularly uh, addressing what we in health um, call the uh, commercial, legal, political, ecological and social determinants of health. But um, in terms of how we move, house, feed and transport ourselves, we actually have um, the technology right now to transition. Um, my colleagues at Climate Works at, um, at Monash um, had a report out earlier this year called Decarbonisation Futures, which um, pretty much show that across um, all industries of energy, infrastructure, transport and agriculture, we're already at a stage um, in many of these areas with the technology that we can scale up to transition in this country, at least. And you might ask, you know, how does this relate to chronic disease? Um, well, in terms of the proven and existing co-benefits of acting on climate change or environment and health. There are many um, transitioning to active transport and uh, green space enlargement leads to better mental health and physical well-being, and also risk of disease. And um, this is exactly the area where perhaps we should use the, the um, benefits of transilience, if I'm using it in the right way, Anna, um, to jump into real investment in the sort of centres that you lead in Vic Health supports in uh, transdisciplinary areas um, and think about how we 
reward uh, researchers and partnerships that are doing transdisciplinary research and uh, think about the kind of projects that are really transformative because that in def by definition is um, trans transdisciplinarity. I find the um, concept of planetary health really useful. It's a definition that was coined in a, a report um, um, also at my other work in, in the, with the Lancet um, that is essentially the health of human civilization and the natural world on which it depends. So it's all about you know, organization and the principles um, of um, planetary health are not only transdisciplinarity, but um, intergenerational equity and also um, you know, looking at the context of where we find ourselves um, right now, you know, we've just had a few months where, um, and you know, uh, and a year of um, school strikes um, for climate change. This is our context, and we have to, um, you know, step up to that. Um, and I find this framing quite useful, you know, looking at the how we organise really, um, rather than um, sticking to our um, very, very good and very excellent, you know, biomedical social health models. I say this as someone trained in medicine, so um, I'm kind of um, putting my foot right into it here. Thanks. Well, thank you for putting your foot right into it. Anna, what are your thoughts? What would you like to add? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Yeah, look, I mean, I actually think, um, you know, the, the points that have already been made are, are starting to come together very cohesively. I mean, I guess in terms of how do we have a different business as usual going forward? So your, your sort of point there. I guess our first thought really in writing this paper was that um, the COVID-19 pandemic and our response to it in particular, um, and especially in Australia, I think, has really demonstrated that we can do things probably differently to how at least we in prevention have, have seen um, we've generally done things. So I think there's a huge opportunity to really try and paint this picture quite vividly that, that the response has touched on a lot of the characteristics that you would see as kind of best practice, if you like, in, in responding to things that might be, you know, complex and, and um, uncertain and disruptive. Um, and they're the things that we've sort of touched on, you know, something that's cohesive in purpose, that you have joint vision backed by, um, I've added Nicola's word in here, trusted leadership, you know, that it has to be collaborative. I think that idea that it needs to be, the prevention really needs to be embedded. Health has to be everybody's business. And I think many of us have remarked on the fact that there's this now kind of general societal understanding and recognition of that inherent interconnection between health and all the other facets of our lives, including employment, you know, income, housing. We've understood that to respond to COVID, we actually have to connect all those dots in a way that I don't think we've really articulated collectively, like a lot of people in prevention and public health do, but more collectively um, for other complex health and social problems. So, and there are many other kind of elements, I think, characteristics that we need to, to build into a really um, resilient and transilient prevention system going forward. But I guess what's what's really interesting to me is the point in a way that, that Nicola was kind of touching on is how do we prioritise and incentivise this response going forward? I think the timing at the moment is really good, um, but we do need funding and we do need incentivization of this approach for other um, complex issues as well as um, trying to come back from COVID. And that's the thing I'd be, be really keen to discuss, just not, not in the least, because I think there's so much we could get out of this response, this, this way of approaching um, these complex health issues and something like health equity, which I think in Australia has really been seen as a too hard to deal with issue, um, we really could actually make some inroads to, to health inequities in Australia if we took that kind of lens and, and accepted that health was connected to unemployment and to housing and to where you live and to your growing, you know, your life conditions mm -hmm. and invested in it in that way we actually might see some progress on health inequities. And so I think there's, there's a lot at stake in terms of trying to really hold on to the things we're starting to learn and making sure that we collectively continue to, to use those learnings in our, in our prevention responses going forward. Absolutely. Uh, does anyone else have anything that they're dying to add to that? We have a whole lot of Slido questions that we need to get to. Does, one have a point that they would like to add to the um, question about how does it differ to business as usual? 
Maybe I'll I'll jump in very briefly. I, th I think and because I have the the NCD, the non-communicable disease hat on. I think the, uh, the uh, as my previous intervention sort of the, what we were building with the SDG and, and and the narrative and the prioritization we had sort of built around the SDG narrative. Um, it, it really has, in, in fast forwarding to COVID, it has demonstrated that we have not really understood that interconnected agenda and how we can implement and enhance that interconnected agenda. For the NCD uh, uh, community and for people living with NCDs, it was a dramatic moment that they were exposed to the issue, to the to realization that governments and communities had not invested enough in understanding the, the, the NCD agenda risk factor, the impact of, 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 of societal um, influences, so determinants, social, economic, commercial determinants on their health and well-being, And that exposed a huge, huge community of people living with NCDs with the disruption of services, with, uh, with, uh, with increased risk factors. I think it's, it's not, not, not necessarily a model, but it is a, 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 pilot, a pilot interaction of, 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 of influences that can be very important to understand the broader picture of interconnected agenda during COVID. We need to understand how to really in, insert people centered approaches, understand what those connections do impact on, on people, and then expand also, I've, I've heard some interesting comments on, on the intersections of people and planet. And so to how do we build back not only healthy, a healthy post-COVID, but a greener health, uh, greener post-COVID um, um, community and, and, uh, and, uh, and platforms. So um, that's my, my point, sort of looking to the NCD and unpackage the NCD agenda and the underinvestments and the, and the challenge the NCD community had and the people living with NCDs have had during COVID to understand this broader picture of interconnected and, and, and health promotion and, and, and health security. Back to you. Shelley, I was going to just um, make a quick comment too. I think that a, a number of the um, panellists are hitting on this issue of the importance of being cross-disciplinary you know, either the professional skills that people bring to it or looking across different sectors of the community. And to me, it paints that picture of um, Anna's, you know, tree that moves in the wind has to have kind of broad enough roots that, you know, we're not all just talking to each other. We've got mm -hmm. to have health people talking with people that work in housing and talking with behavioural economists and talking with people who are expert in communications and if we don't do that, we, we can have fantastic theories, but we mightn't all have the skills then to be able to, to operationalise them in some way. So I think really thinking differently about cross-disciplinary work is vital and finding a way then to encourage um, governments and others to invest in the factors that actually enable those partnerships to truly work. Um, and that's hard and messy and it's more people and it's more coordination, mm. but it will actually make us more transilient into the future. I'm sure it will. Opie, do you have anything you would like to add? They seem to have covered so much. <laughs> it's hard being last. <laughs> um, no, just, um, you know, I'm really energised by, by what's been said because, you know, I think a determinant of health approach and, you know, the planetary health um, is a really beautiful, I agree, Selena, way to describe it, is probably the one that, you know, it's, it's time for its day in the sun. Um, how can stakeholders from housing, education, town planning, community development, communicable and non-communicable disease health sectors, to name a few, work together to create health promoting communities and environments that are preventative for all diseases. Um, you know, I think that we've seen uh, the interaction between communicable and non-communicable diseases play out. As we know, people with diabetes and pre-existing conditions are more at risk of adverse outcomes when it comes to COVID. Um, we've seen screening rates uh, for cancer go down during this time as a result of this infectious agent. So. Uh, these concepts like primary health, uh, you know, universal health care, it's really the time to break out of these silos, going back to Nicola again. Um, it's really time for some of these concepts to, to really take what's happening as the sparks to, for real, do, do, this, uh, do, do this interwoven, interconnected uh, approach that's needed. It sure is. Now, Nicola, we've got a question here from Josephine. How do we get the government on board with prevention? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I think that um, people 
people often fall into two different categories. One is either to be very passive and quite critical of the government for failing to do X, Y or Z. And then the other that say, well, hang on, we have to create a community that makes a fertile ground for governments to feel it's safe to act. And I think a combination of um, the environment we're facing now with this big challenge um, in dealing with COVID-19 really al allows you to cross over for those. You know, there's actually something that the community feels very strongly about and is really aware of, and it's something that the government's really focused on. Um, but we all have to own how much importance we give it. You know, governments reflect us and they reflect us if we think that this is valuable and important and makes us um, healthier and stronger and care about it, then they're more likely to act. Now, of course, it's even better when there's fabulous leadership that might help the community move their position. Um, but I think we we actually are not powerless in this. It's it's too easy to say we have no control and it's nothing to do with us. Um, and actually, you know, this group and, and no doubt many of the people listening are activists in some way, um, not, not in the way that um, newspapers sometimes like to paint that as a bad thing, activists in caring about changing the community. And so I think that is a way to help government to, you know, actually bothering to ring up a um, radio station, raise something with a local member, be prepared to campaign on things, you know, that actually doesn't happen as much as you would think and governments do listen to it. So I think mm. there is an opportunity. Um, people shouldn't feel powerless to help make that change. But unless we also create an environment that governments can act in, then it's harder to just expect them to do it out there on their own before anybody's talking about it. So I think it goes both ways. Um, we can put more pressure on governments to do things that we want if we participate in raising those issues to a certain level of importance. Thank you. Now, Anna Hazel has asked here, what is the role of health in advocating for better internet infrastructure to support telehealth and online health promotion initiatives to address the digital divide which is leaving low socioeconomic communities behind? Thanks for the question. So health has a very large role in exactly your question, um, both in terms of, I think, developing um, new platforms, new technologies, so that the burden, the sort of internet burden is lower, but also then in terms of evaluating the programs that are out there um, and trying to identify who are they working for and, as you point out, and who are they not working for, and therefore how do we adapt around that? So where can they be um, improved and where do you actually need complementary strategies, primary care being a really good one, sort of... Um, remote clinics being another good one. So I think it's, it's always going to be a complementary model of care that's required, particularly in um, remote areas. And, um, and, and that is health's responsibility to think through and to build both from the perspective of um, the, the health networks and the health researchers and policymakers. But I think it's also a really great case in point um, that we've just all been talking about, that if we're really going to make a big difference to, to the outcomes that we're interested in, then that is when we actually have to get lots of different disciplines in the room at the same time. So again, health can be a driver of that and often is. Um, but unless we have all the different people around the table, so the, the digital innovators, the finances who understand um, how to actually fund the different telehealth systems, um, then I think it becomes very difficult. And obviously the community leaders, then it becomes very difficult to, to find what is the right solution. I guess the only other thing I would add is I think what we've learned from COVID, which again, I think is an important lesson, is that we, we need for most big um, health and social issues, we're going to need a combination of responses which are both kind of the overarching, if you like, whole of community or whole of society responses, and then some more tailored responses that respond to, to more, um, you know, significant local community needs. And, and that I think we've seen really clearly in the response to COVID and people's uptake of different messages and response to different messages. And um, we should really take that forward for everything we're doing. So telehealth is going to be a case in point there. Yeah. Very well answered. Now, Guy, um, Lynette is asking, is there a place like a community that is where they are sharing best practices and enablers during COVID-19? What have you seen? Well, at WHO, uh, very, very focused on trying to build those communities. Um, uh, and in particular, because of the huge 
impact exposed on, on, on communities, people living with NCDs. It's an urgent issue to really provide best practices, um, analyze those, those, those cases and, 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 and sort of promote, um, promote innovative approaches to the Build Back Better. So I, at WHO, we are, throughout the, my team and sort of other teams in, in, in the house, we are providing communities of practice. We are providing technical working groups. We are providing um, uh, uh, policy briefs, communications pieces. We are convening policymakers. We're convening community leaders. We're convening, uh, convening people living with NCDs. We're convening youth in different formats. I can share links uh, to, to, to the group afterwards so we can share with, the, with those uh, participating. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's critical. It's critical that we start co-creating, co-creating the solutions uh, for the for the healthy and greener uh, build back better approaches. Uh, uh, the, the community of people living with, the community of youth, the community, the communities themselves are really are the ones that are demonstrating at our level, at global level, but also at, at, at local and national level, they're really demonstrating the gaps, pinpointing the gaps mm -hmm. and pinpointing those interconnections that will serve their purposes, will serve their own health and well-being, and where we are failing them, where we are failing them with digital solutions, where we are failing them with, with, with service delivery, and where we are failing them with health promotion and, and preventive measures. And I think it's critical that we start uh, really understanding and unpackaging these communities and start building participatory governance. I think one of the main, and I think we've just discussed what are the main trigger points for, 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 for sustainable solutions to the post-COVID uh, pandemic. And it is co-creation. It is really understanding uh, the value of lived experiences and the value of community experience and, and, and identify, mm -hmm. identifying some of those gaps. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Selena, Leanne has asked, Community involvement is vital to building back better. Yes, absolutely. How can we better work with consumers and their insights too? Thanks very much for the question. I have to have a few moments to think on that. Um, the, the one thing that um, uh, we recognise across nearly um, all um, health disciplines and um, interventions is the importance of uh, listening to the consumer, listening to the community. From the, in, in, in kind of recent years, there's been a growing scholarship around what we're calling the commercial determinants of health, um, the um, importance and also risk of um, um, industry um, influence on our choices of products, but also different influences um, on, on industry in terms of the who comes to the table, you know, whether it's at a multilateral level, such as the UN, or whether it's um, at a national level in terms of the policies that are being put forward. I don't really know the answer. I think maybe someone like Anna would be best at, in terms of um, answering that for obesity, but I could certainly point you towards um, some countries' um, legislative or constitutional actions in this regard. And funnily enough, you know, one is actually China, China, you know, for all the criticisms that we can make of it, has actually mandated um, to um, commit to this notion of eco civilization, you know, creating eco civilization. And what that's meant in practice is that quite a number of um, state owned enterprises and companies have been asked to look at, you know, their their um, um, green practices and their responsibilities. And we'll have to just wait and see, you know, where that goes going forward. The other is an act in Wales that is um, an act that was enacted in 2015 called the um, uh, um, Health and Wellbeing of Future Gen sorry, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which is really quite extraordinary, building on the Welsh um, um, experience in sustainable development and really looking at health and environment. And in there, you know, the, the question would be, you know, can we write into acts such as that and legislation protections um, for consumers and um, some kind of um, ombudsman or um, complaints mechanism with, you know, with monitoring. Uh, we are actually, you know, a number of people globally are looking at this question, but um, maybe, you know, maybe others on the panel can answer more specifically for Australia. Is there anyone else who would like to add to that question? No? Look, I mean, I think it's a, I think there's, it's a really long answer. So I'm happy to mm. kind of hold there. I think you've done a great job, Selena. Um, if there are lots more questions, but just if you want me to speak more, let me know, Shelley. 
Uh, I think um, I think Selena did a better job than she thought she did. So thank you. Now I think we all realise now that the ripple effects of coronavirus will certainly be felt for years to come. I'm interested in each panel member's vision for health promotion and prevention. Where do each of you hope health promotion will be in two years and beyond? And we'll start with you, Topi. Yeah, I have to unblock your mic. Maybe she can't hear us. I'll start with you then, Nicola, while we're working out with Topi. Gosh, so many things and being asked <laughs> to just have one uh, vision on it. Look, I, I think in some ways it's, you know, old ideas being refreshed. You know, you don't always have to create a new idea. It's just we need to find a way to, to act on it. So I actually think that a lot of what we've been talking about, there, there has been a lot of um, guidance for us of what the vision could look like in the future. And it is around that broader social determinants of health. And I think um, Guy sort of mentioned it with the um, sustainable development goals. We know that we need to change the system to empower individuals in a better way. We know we have to have better support networks. I think my vision is how do we allow that to truly have voice? You know, I, I, we don't know that there will be another pandemic. There'll be more um, challenges from non-communicable diseases. There'll be different industries lobbying for things that aren't necessarily going to be good for the community. And so I think in some ways we, we know all of that. We don't have to find something new. The new bit is how do we bring it all together for that really to make a difference for the community? And I think it has to be people-based. Um, I love the idea of transilience because it captures all that fleet-footedness that um, we need communities to have to be really smart and responsive and able to be comfortable with the sorts of challenges we face into the future. So, um, you know, my, my vision, as I said before, is to really see primary care um, front and centre finding its true voice, um, trusted and providing, you know, good supported services to the community. Beautiful. I like that a lot. Toby, are you with us now? Hi, yes. Hopefully you can uh, hear me. So, look, in terms of what the vision is, for me, you know, COVID's really brought inequities to the forefront. You know, that realisation that our mental health, what we, how much we exercise, drink, smoke, they're all influenced by so many factors, financial insecurity, job losses, access to reliable internet. We heard about walkability of neighbourhoods, domestic violence, aggressive marketing tactics by industry, languages spoken at home, postcodes, as we know in Melbourne, uh, determines where and how you can move these days. So one of my favourite parts of the paper asked if when we talk about we, does that include those who've lost their livelihoods, those whose livelihoods are not coming back, does that include all of us from culturally and linguistically diverse communities? rural and remote, which is where most of our achievement program members come from. For me, the vision involves the determinants of health approach. It has to use its time for that. And I really think that Transilience provides us with a framework. It's this call to action in a way at the individual level, organisational, community and societal. What do we want to let go of? You know, what do we want to carry forward and what are we going to do differently? So, so that's from my point Perfect. of view. Perfect. Absolutely. Guy, what are your thoughts? My quick thoughts, I think, with the time. Um, I, I, my vision for health promotion is that it it it, it can it can integrate and maybe um, layer promotion for well being. And I think we have to unpackage what well being really is. Is health and well being? The well being is 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 slightly becoming sort of a, a buzzword without we really concrete definition and understanding of how we can promote well-being. And I think this has been really clearly exposed during the COVID um, uh, beyond the health issues. What is the, what is the definition? How can we promote and empower a community that builds its well-being? And what that, that, what that well-being, I think we've all touched on interconnected agendas. We've all talked, uh, discussed the social determinants, but also what is the, what is the, what is the participatory um, um, responsibility in well-being? 
And that means accountability for stakeholders and accountability for governments, accountability for, for communities themselves. But it also means understanding that agenda at the people level. And, and that will then tri triple in and, 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 and sort of feed into other processes of integrating health into primary health care and UH, NCDs into UHC. It's understanding what that well-being agenda really is. And maybe we have, we have, a, we have, to, we have a bit more work to do um, mm -hmm. in the global community and, the, and, and to, to really support understanding that. We sure do, but we are trying, aren't we? That's for sure. Selena, what would you like to add quickly? We're quickly running out of time. Very quickly. Um, I, I would like to um, um, use the notion of leapfrogging um, into the systems and legislation needed to promote um, planetary and civilizational health. And I will leave it at that. Beautiful. Love your work. Anna, final thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I would see us as very successful if we get widespread acceptance of the interconnectedness we've all spoken about between all the different sectors and all the different outcomes so that every other sector is working for health outcomes and health sector is also working for the outcomes that are of significance to all the other sectors of community. It blows my mind that that isn't happening. So um, thank you for pointing it out again and hopefully they're listening to you. Thank you so much to all of you. You're absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Topi, Selena, Anna, Guy and Nicola for sharing your thoughts. You've been wonderful guests this week. And I'm sure everybody that was watching and joining us got so much from you. So thank you for joining us this week. And thank you to Jasmine for her fantastic work as always. She captures what we've all spoken about beautifully and you can get that afterwards on the website as well. And I've seen it on all of the socials. It's been five weeks of really thought provoking ideas and discussion. And I know that Nick Health are t taking the themes that are arising from the series and incorporating them into work going forward as well as thinking about future events that could continue on these key discussions. Thank you to Vic Health for having me as your MC for the past three weeks. It's been absolutely brilliant. Take care, everybody. Wear your masks and stay home as much as possible and good luck moving forward. Thank you again. Thank you.